and recording in five, four, three, two, one. Hello, everyone, and welcome to DiceWise Entertainment's channel, The GM's Cut. Today, we are live streaming for the first time in a long time, the man from Osirian, Mummy's Mask. What are we doing? The Man from Osirian is a double series. It's a podcast. It's a vodcast. It's a live stream. There will be Mummy's Mask as well as a boatload of origin stories from the Pathfinder Society adventures that tie a lot of lore from Mummy's Mask and before Osirian and the Inner Sea region, Taldor, Chaliax, it's all connected through the Pathfinder Society, and you'll be surprised what NPCs of the past and our other stories will influence our player characters in several of our other podcasts. So if you guys are really down for the entire Joss Whedon, Avengers, Thor movie, Ant-Man movie, Iron Man movie, the entire picture, we suggest you listen to our up-and-coming podcast, vodcast stream, The Foul Play Podcast where we will be playing and streaming Hell's Rebels as well as Hell's Vengeance. But today, we're in the desert. Oh God, Frank, how long has it been since I pitched years. you Mummy's Mask? <laughs> years and years and years. Well, we're finally here on a Sunday afternoon, bringing you a snippet, a taste, a pilot. In the house with me today, as you've just heard, is Frank Hamilton. Hey everybody. And who will you be playing today? What are we doing today? Who are we playing? Um, today I'm going to be playing uh, Old Man Arif, starting level one as a almost geriatric character, just to see uh, how that goes. I kind of like the idea of playing the old kind of wise man. So yeah, I'm, I'm going to play that shtick. Not just a stick. We actually stuck you with the old template, the venerable template. Which template did we stick you with? Uh, he is old. He so he has the old template. Okay. Uh, here so yeah uh some modifiers to like int i think it's uh plus two but minus three to all of his physical stats Ooh. well we'll see how that goes also in the house we have newcomer to dicewise entertainment under doing several cameos under the Rollmonger's banner, you will see her do cameo performances in Dice Before Dishonor. You will see her in our Man from Assyrian, the Infernal Vault official edition. And you will also see her in her first starring role here. Miss Ashley Pascarello. Such a great name. It just rolls off the tongue. Oh my gosh, you actually got it right that time. I've been practicing for the Twitch stream. <laughs> Yes, so I will be playing a drow paladin. Ooh. Her name is Callista as Renee. Okay. Um, she is from Erdesir, which is the in the largest drow city of Zirnakanen. So what are you doing way out here in Osirian? It's a bit of a stretch. She um, had a change of heart after witnessing her parents kill her younger brother hmm. and fled the city. And now she is uh, following Phrasma. So what happens in between? Which cave did you pop out of? Because I do believe you, you found, you sold me on this character by talking about the actual exit strategy popping up where? She actually... Um, clawed her way out of the Pyramid of Camaria, which was the burial place of the Pharaoh Camaria, who is the only Assyrian ruler to have openly worshipped the god Ravagug. Ooh, that sounds creepy. Next, we have Matt Witt, one of our founding fathers. The guy that sat in a coffee shop and, you know, listened to a whole bunch of my ideas and has encouraged me along the way, taught me some things about Twitch, and is now going to be playing who? I'm going to be playing uh, Vex Vandal, a Suli rogue, who is, uh, you know, from the slums of Katapesh, but uh, through slave trading and and just general roguiness, he made his way north to Osirian. Now, the Sulis, uh, it comes out of Katapesh, they're like the Arabic culture as opposed to Osirian's Egyptian-style alternate Earth culture? Yes. 
And what can you tell me about the Suli race? What is widely known? You don't have to give away all your secrets, but what's widely known about them? The basic gist, they are, uh, they're genie kin. So, so somewhere in my ancestry, one of my ancestors had some shenanigans with uh, a genie. Yeah, basically. And it's come out in eventually through our my bloodline to me. But I'm not even quite sure what I am. I just have some abilities that normal folks don't. But I look normal. I look like an average Katapeshian person. Uh, street walker. <laughs> <laughs> what? All right. I'm just, I'm just filthy. Oh, I see. In general. Okay. I gotcha. I gotcha. Yeah, not not like red light district street walker. A street urchin, maybe, would be a better term. I don't know. Anyways. No, that's, uh... That's cool. Very, 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 very Hello, cool. internets. <laughs> and last but not least, now, Ashley Florence couldn't be with us today, but you will see cameos from her as well. You will see cameos, actually, from many of the Rollmongers' extended cast, but this is a bit of a separate project. But today we have Ryan Messina. Hello. And what are you playing today? I'm playing an android paladin. What? Designation. Yeah. What? What? It's crazy. Crazy. <laughs> Madness. It's supposed to be Pathfinders or something. Yeah, really? Well, obviously, that is something a little bit too interesting. So we're actually going to get into Ryan's character as we play. Because why are we dropping... An android in the middle of Osirian seems like a little bit of like, you know, hey DM, can, can I play my, you know, my sword exalts or the same thing thing? And it's completely murder hobo circus. No, no, no. We have found several interesting um, ties to a sty- starfindery universe, shall we say? I mean, look at Iron Gods. Pre gap, spaceships are happening. They drop out of the sky, androids are there. So we're wrapping a, sort of a little sub story to go along with our Mummy's Mask podcast so that we are not like the regular Mummy's Mask podcast. Now, are we sticking to core AP? Yes, we are. We are running Mummy's Mask in this instance of this podcast for Twitch audience and recorded for YouTube and hopefully later an actual podcast as well to go with the regular man from the Syrian stuff. But we're actually going to get into side reasons, sub reasons, subplots, and solid role play of why a dro, a Kalashite scholar, a Suli vagabond, and an android paladin would all eventually end up digging in the dirt. I mean, you were there. Our ruby prince, Pharaoh Kemet III, why not seven years ago, opened up Sothis to all foreign trade, and said, go out into the nearby desert, into the under dunes, and have at the pyramids that suddenly popped up. They discovered a lot of things. They discovered a place called the Hollow, where four pyramids actually activated a green, interesting sandstone pyramid, and all hell broke loose. Then, shortly after, funny enough, during that adventure, those players, whoever they may be, went head to head with a rival party from Cheliax. In the next adventure, a duchess from Chaliax sets up shop and does the Nazi Indiana Jones mega dig to unearth yet another pyramid, a famous stone packed pyramid, which again, both adventures tie into the famous four pharaohs of ascension. Why is that relevant? Well, once again, it worked then, huge boon to the economy. Pharaoh Kemet has decreed the city of Wati has a huge necropolis taking up one third of it. There's a big historic reference there, but we're going to skip it right now. In a nutshell, if foreigners come and dig up this stuff and sell it in the city, another economic boom. The only problem is that entire city is mostly controlled by the Phrasmic church who went, no. And you know what Pharaoh said? I am Pharaoh. And they went, okay. But to make it fair, they decided on a lottery so that people couldn't just dig into a history book, find the best real estate and go digging there. It had to remain impartial, but we'll get into that. Right now, our story starts several, several light years away. A single adamantine 
stone casing holding a very dangerous cargo is aboard a ship, a spaceship. It is boarded by pirates, and in the ensuing fight against the existing crew, things get out of hand. The FTL drive is engaged, and a random jump into deep, deep, deep alien galactic space. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds years ago, during a great magical plague that swept through Wati, lying it low. The old gods and old priests of those gods could do nothing. The new gods, specifically the priests of Pharasma, saved the day and worship for an entire nation changed to new gods, Pharasma, Adabar, Nethys. The old gods have not been forgotten, but back then this was a big thing. They swept up the magical plague. They cleaned up and they contained one third of the city into a sealed off walled necropolis. During this time, our FTL drive jump ship enters orbit, a blind jump too far, too close to a celestial body and is getting sucked in to Glorian's sun. Automated systems, captains that are left alive, people struggling with the pirates, eject the precious but dangerous cargo and a cargo pod is ejected and burns up in Galorian's atmosphere, streaking from the sky over the continent of Gurundi, over the land of Osirian, and falls stripped away of its metal components, nothing but an amantine rock shell splashes down into the river. Our head Phrasmite priest at the time declares this what? It, it, it's interesting you would ask about that. Um, uh, Phrasma's needle stands proudly now in Wati's necropolis, greeting mourners as they come to entomb their loved ones in the famous burial sites. Uh, uh, 1,700 years ago, while the Phrasman priest Nifu Sheeps began the process of rebuilding the city, uh, uh, along with the, the sealing away the dead parts of the city from the living and consecrating the necropolis, a stone fell from the heavens and streaked through the sky. It plunged into the waters of the river Sphinx. Nifru decreed the celestial vent as an omen of favor from the Lady of Graves and had those workers retrieve the stone from the riverbed. Uh, uh, stone cutters toiled for decades to sculpt this piece of meteorite into a capstone for the obelisk set into the city's necropolis and as a symbol of Phrasma's blessing over the city of Wati. Interesting thing about history and lore, ladies and gentlemen, what is written is written by mankind and it is from their perspective. The truth? Well, that's my job as your GM, to shed a little more light to a broader audience. What Master Arf says is true. It is written and it is the events as they viewed them 1700 years ago. The adamantine stone was pulled from the river, dragged into the city of Osirian, and made a monument to the goddess of fate and death. And atop this monument, it sits and has sat for 1700 years until recently. Before the Pharaoh decreed seven years ago, before the events of Wati that we see now today are about to unfold. Even at Mantine, as strong as it is, the hardest stone, Starstone, known to glory in mankind, eventually withers, erodes, and is subject to time and the elements. Eventually, the tiniest hole, the tiniest minuscule crack, it does not help that the masons of the time took a large meteorite and shaped it, chiseled it into a peak pyramid and stuck it on top of the spire itself, mimicking the actual spire that the Lady of Bones lords over in her domain. But that's another story. For right now, a tiniest crack could let something out? Not likely. And yet, in the time we're mentioning now, one, ten, a hundred, 
a hundred thousand microscopic nanites in a swarm crawl forth in the middle of the night crawl down the spire across the sands over and under the gates of the wall and into the city seeking also 10 years ago alive in the city streets the sun is high a young suli is running through the marketplace guards and merchants alike chasing him stop thief they cry the young boy dashing amongst the crowd ha, hoo, ha, yeah you'll never catch me but unfortunately as trying to require a meal wealth trying to survive like all desert street rats eventually he is caught punishment for thievery and wati is severe the boy's hand is cut straight from his wrist without remorse without hesitation they immediately take their grim trophy to the center of the actual marketplace and string it up amongst several other thieves hands is actually considered lucky to open your stall near this post full of grim trophies because the punishment for stealing is as such the boy shoved aside left to bleed and bandage pulling strips of rotted clothing from his person bandaging his pain bandaging his anguish the young lad had not made it this far without having a certain will and determination and it is that will and determination seeking shelter from the desert sun where he crawls himself to recruit in a nearby alley and realizing that his fate has far turned shall we say a lot more grim Phrasma, they say goddess of fate and death can be impartial and yet if she designs someone's fate that certain events must unfold or perhaps chooses someone in the moment is for scholars and priests alike to debate an hour later delirium blood loss staining the ragged the boy's stump whining in pain in a dark alley something finds him one ten a hundred a hundred thousand nanites crawling along the corner of the alley covering the boy searching for orifice the blood attracting them the stain entering the wound entering his nostrils entering his mouth entering places that we're not going to mention writhing in agony and shock crawling his cries from the nearby alley are swallowed up by the loud commerce and bustle of the day's busy marketplace in Osirian, and then all fall silent. Years later, emerging into the hot desert sun, a lone woman escaping her fate, clawing her way out of a pyramid in N, makes her way to a river a new life, extremely light sensitive, an upside down world to her with a scorching orb in the sky. Water is nearby, water is life. A lone drow female, parched, lies on the brink of fatigue, exhaustion, and death. And again, whether designed by Phrasma herself, mere chance, or fate intervening. A river priestess of Wajet, ancient Osirian's goddess of rivers, canals, and lakes, finds her, tends to her, and introduces her to a city life where to survive, she quickly learns the common language and is inducted into not a phrasmic priest order, but the strong-willed, even-tempered woman is inducted into the Voices of the Spire, the militant arm of the Phrasmic Church. However, not being human, not being Grundy, being foreign, and still a reputation of her people precede her, she is accepted into the church, but must study harder, train harder, and show the utmost lawful good example, even to be remotely accepted by her peers. Still, 
Anything is better from the life that she left behind. Anything is better from the life that she chose to escape from. And every day she prays and thanks Phrasma for her second chance and she shall serve. Not far and years later again, from that very spot where she crawled forth, another city, a city that boasts the greatest archive in all of Gurundi, the city of Tenfu. An elderly scholar, seeking knowledge endlessly, even into the, his years of twilight. A cloistered cleric of Phrasma. A choice, not fate. But those who serve Phrasma must serve a greater fate, sooner or later. And though this man's eyes and arthritis, one is waning, one is swelling up, and he knows he must compel himself to study longer, to delve deeper, to gain as much lore as possible for his own goals or for the knowledge that he seeks for his goddess. I have a single question for Frank Hamilton. Yes? Master Arif, if the god of knowledge is embodied in Irori, why did Master Arif choose Phrasma? Well, sometimes Phrasma works in, in, in very mysterious ways. Was it, was it fate that first brought me to uh, Iman's house? Iman being the wise, of, of course. Yeah, everyone knows that. I, Iman has many, many uh, 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 atlases and, and, and tomes, you know, inked in his name. Was it fate that brought me to his doorstep that I may drink in his knowledge? Who knows? Uh, we, we, we just don't question the will of Phrasma. We just do, uh, you know, as, as fate compels us. Well, I suppose one can always listen to our up-and-coming podcast, The Man from Assyrian, where we will delve into, shall we say, a more complicated backstory than just being smitten by Phrasma to be laid low by nanites. The Man from Assyrian is not necessarily about one man that we're playing today. Remember, Master Arif is Kalashite, not Osirian. So who is the man from Osirian? Listen to both podcasts, watch our vodcast, and find out, and we will delve deeper into the mysteries of Phrasma and the lore and why we have chosen this name. Last, but not least, ten years ago, a Ninot swarm attacks a boy. Seven years ago, Pharaoh decrees the opening an exploration to foreign trade to four pyramids found in the Underdunes. Upriver of Sothis, downriver of Wati. This very year, Pharaoh Kemet has decreed that the priests of Phrasma organize the excavation of the necropolis in the half-dead city, as it is known, the city of Wati, which lies on the river Sphinx at the crux between the Asp and Crook River. South, but considered upriver in the desert lands of Osirian, is where our story truly begins. For 10 years, this boy has wrestled with his fate. Did he die? No, the Suli survived. And now a young man walks proudly amongst the citizens of Sothis. Vex. Yes. For some reason, Phrasma herself intervened. The stump of your hand healed over. You did not die from blood loss. Blessed be the keeper of secrets. Tell me, do you believe in the gods, old and new? Do you believe it was fate that saved you as you woke up? after suffering a living nightmare of something consuming you and sensing an emotion, a new comp- compulsion inside you and miraculously finding your, you know, the bone exposed, the flesh bleeding out, completely healed over in a nice fleshy little stump. This is a very good question. Does he believe in the gods or do the gods believe in him? He has no time for such trivial thoughts. Being of the street... Walking the streets of Soth- Sothis, everything is rich and new. It is the hub of Osirian. But when news hits of the Ruby Prince's latest proclamation that 
In Wati, anyone is allowed to register a party and enter the lottery to literally dig up the dead and find riches beyond belief. It's too good to pass up. Word spreads from Sothis, the capital, where the Ruby Prince himself has decreed such a law. Spreading outward, 360 in every direction. And where our paladin, Dro, emerged years ago. Temfu, where our master, Arif, cloister cleric of Phrasma, currently is studying. And Wati itself, where both the voices of the spire worshipping Phrasma and the priesthood of Phrasma have recalled both characters to their ranks. The city of Wati swells tenfold inside as trade, merchants, and especially adventurers seeking their wealth buried within the city swell the city's ranks. The church orders all able bodies up and down the river that they can spare to come to Wati to help with the lottery, to help become watchful priests to police, delegate, advise, and make sure that Wati does not break into lawless chaos getting on a boat making your way up river Vex is one of many starry eyed all who head to Wati this year have one thing in mind perhaps except one another starship another FTL jump this time with purpose android reclamation designation R3N. The ship's autopilot system has dumped you into a solar system with a single solar body, and third planet from the sun is where a beacon has been signaling into deep space for the past 10 years. Your organization ordered you to reclaim a dangerous, alien, nanite, sentient, hostile assimilation program that has turned itself into nanites and has gotten free. It was being transported years ago and thought lost. The only way to contain this thing is in solid rock in a capsule. And if that rock and capsule is breached, also within said capsule is an emergency transmitter, sort of a bing, 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 jailbreak, jailbreak. It is transmitted for 10 years and has taken 10 years for that signal to reach space where your people and your android line work. They dump you in a ship. They send you out retracing the beacon. Best guess. And unfortunately, like the last ship, you were pulled out of FTL way too close to the solar body. Beeping, alarms, emergency signals go off like mad. What do you do? A scripted dashboard pops up and words come across as the the autopilot of the ship has dumped you too close to the sun it was a hazardous jump you volunteered for the mission and uh, you know best guess puts you here alarms radiation alarms all kinds of things are going off near escape trajectory the ship's engines are online but it's going to take a lot to correct the course and you will have been long sort of deactivated due to radiation exposure the ship's automatic pilot systems recommend abandoning ship you don't have time to like pull up out of the deep dive of the sun you just have to trust the autopilot will do it for you but that sort of long curve next to the radiation flares it's going to fry you before that ship gets away from it i see to the nearest escape pod Okay. The nearest escape pod is actually a landing survival pod. It's not just a jettison tank that gets you off ship. It is actually equipped with certain functions to survive on a hostile landing surface. A Mandel pod, which luckily for you, contains a mechanized artificial nanite distribution exobiological lander unit or Mandel for short. You jump in. Wordlessly. You pop the hatch. No, wordlessly. <laughs> you jump in, you pop the hatch, you expel yourself, and on the dark side of the moon, as it were, the dark side of the planet, 
Okay? You have to be expelled directly away from the sun. And so that your pod, again, does not get sucked into the gravity. It takes a very long out into deep space sort of wide arc and comes all the way back around to the dark side of Galorian and comes crashing down on a continent, scanning for a body of water to help soften the impact, but not a deep body of water. It crashes down in a river. Deflector shields malfunctioning. Metallic panels stripping away in the heat and the interior cockpit of your pod heating up to dangerous levels and then instantly cooled, boiling all hostile aquatic life forms within like several hundred feet of the pod crashing down into this river. The river boils and churns and the pod sinks a, shall we say, 15, 20 feet to the bottom amongst a thick bramble of reeds and weeds. After your horrid ordeal, uh, check some of the instruments, see how badly damaged we we are. Okay. You have sustained, I would say, significant damage, enough to be an annoyance, but the pod remains intact. Systems can be recovered and eventually come back online. Your energy cells and the reserve cells to manufacture items as well as life support are fully functional. However, any sort of um, landing gear unfortunately is malfunctioning so you can't sort of like the, the pod would land and then little feet would pop out and it would erect itself up into like a little tent house that stuff's all wrecked and destroyed or malfunctioning from the stripped away panels and deflector shields some auxiliary systems that do minor little comforts for you also malfunctioning your uh main sort of say power core um the auxiliary fuel tanks and everything are burnt out, right? But the internal fuel system, the internal core that powers everything is at 98%. So that's not too bad considering you dropped out of space. How is the local environment? You scan. It says that you are in aquatic terrain currently. The Mandel system comes online eventually and, you know, asks for input, I guess you could say. And out, system analysis. There's like a message pops up, you read it, and it's like, you know, you have entered and are currently using a M-A-N-D-E-L, Mandel, you know, survival lander escape pod. The mechanized artificial nanite distribution exobiological lander has, and there's all these terms and conditions, like tons of terms and conditions. You just scroll to the bottom, you know, do you accept? And accept. You don't bother reading it, you'll read it later. Or you just, you know, absorb everything. It's all binary. Okay. You hit accept. Yes. Yep. You hit accept and an actual uh, link up upload to your, it's like a Bluetooth. It scans for a Bluetooth and your personal comm, your seven galactic dollar comm that you carry on you. It connects to that. And it's like, Welcome. I'm Cortana. You have entered with the Mandel landing helmet. Information. The environment past the aquatic immediacy. You are seven meters aquatic flowing, approximately twenty meters wide, approximately sedimentary ground, one meter below landing atmosphere, six point five to seven of barometric pressures normal, oxygen carbon level normal, hydrogen level nominal. Wind, air, temperature within M class planet rating nominal. Any nearby habitats? Life signs? You hear the sound of uh, a compartment detaching out exterior of the pod, like it's the pod's launched something. Pulling back from the scene, a small hatch opens and like a little uh, you know, robot pod kind of like just floats up to the surface and just pops up floating there. Little tiny aerials pop up and, you know, set out radar, scanning, you know, some high tech for this world, but like very nominal, boring scanning systems, very basic stuff for the tech that you're used to. It is a Mandel unit. Hmm. Well, it's designed for, like, ruggedness and harsh conditions as opposed to, like, really high-tech finery. You know, you're not going to be whining dining tonight, that's for sure. That's what you need to eat. 
or sleep or subject to fatigue. Anyway, it, uh, it takes a moment or three to gather a bunch of data and then finally starts giving you a sort of like, again, it's more like a, a printout in front of you on the screen as opposed to just telling you into the earpiece. A topography? Yeah. Shows you like a, a very 1980s green grid video game topographical map and an indication of where your pod is and showing lines that show the river and how it's laid out into a fork and how um, upriver you've crashed, you know, like 320 meters from a settlement, which there it's scanning like a couple thousand life forms. Hmm. Signs of civilization and modems of intelligence. Resources of cash, I'm assuming, are located in the settlement. Uh, it's not able to scan its level of technology, but it can scan for a couple of basic things like is there an FTL drive? Is there like a reactor core nearby that's, you know, powering a city? Um, it can scan for the beacon, the reason you're here. It can scan, you know, like very simple. I, you know, I, where's the heat? Yeah. Where's the magma? Where's the this? You know, that kind of thing. Um, where's, where's the radio waves? You know, is this place giving off radio or any kind of signal? So I'm getting like a lot of zeros, is what you're saying. Yep. Oh, yeah. <laughs> radio, zero. You know, biomagical thermal, zero. Mm. You know, nuclear, zero. You know. Mm. Um, also, there is something else. It scans that there's something, some kind of interference in the air, and it's not sure what it is. An unknown alien interference, like a biometric energy wave, it's pulsing. And it doesn't know what it is. It can't identify it. Hmm. Let's scan for our target. Okay. It gives you coordinates, and it claims to be contained deep within the settlement. The beacon. Carry on with uh, local analysis. Attempt to discover what the interference is. All right. The scene pulls out as the android sits several meters below the surface of the water, taking in as much knowledge as the limited Mandel survival system can gain him. Moving across to the city itself, we pop the surface, shall we say, and learn that it is nighttime here in the land of Osirian, that Wati lays mostly dormant, that in a very short few days' time, if not on the morrow, uh, the hustle and bustle of excitement in Wati will reach a limit that has not been seen in seven years. Several hours pass. And just before dawn, a single figure emerges. Startling Gurundi women that come down the main steps into the river. I'm going to show you now a map of Wati. What are we looking at? What are we looking at? What tea are we looking at? You are looking at an unmarked map of Wati. The blackened out portion is what lies within the tall 30 foot stone towered guarded walls of the necropolis. We don't really know what's in there. We've heard of what's in there, but it's not like I'm going to map it for you at this moment. Okay? Right here, behind the great vault bank slash church of Abadar, lies grand steps leading down to the water's edge. Young maidens trying to dodge crocodiles and rising up first ahead, you guys know the scene from the Highlander when he falls underwater, but he tries to drown him. Then he realizes he's not going to drown and he cuts his way through the weeds <laughs> and then he just starts coming up out of the water. Right? Yeah. yeah. Can you describe Reclamation Droid R3N? What do these women see as you just sort of plod your way out of the sand and silt up onto... Average height, six foot, medium build... But the uh, main thing that stands out is it's very shiny armor and it's form fit. So it's very smooth. There's no working marks on it. And uh, on on my back, there's a giant square shield with uh, 
symbols and numerology on it. Okay. If you were uh, to think in Pathfinder terms, like obviously this is like space tech armor or form fitting armor, right? What's the closest yes. thing? What's the closest like leather armor, scale mail, plate mail? Like what? What would they? What would their consciousness perceive? It's like what do they think? It's obviously alien, fancy, or different looking, but you know their brain has to assimilate to something. Going well, he's wearing this. Banded mail. Banded mail. Okay. Yes, with a tower shield. Okay. And do you have anything unusual, like aerial aerial radials sticking out of your backpack, or you know, an unusual hair color? Are you bald? Do you have a helmet like Judge Dredd? Do we see your face? Do we see your skin color? Do you look like a guy, a girl, a lizard, giant space lizard? What do you look like? Oh yeah, it's <laughs> well, uh, kind of like just a normal dude, uh, crew cut and hair, hair. So it's like just cut short, uh, clean shaven, uh, blue eyes, and. Yeah, it just looks like a normal dude outside of... Now, the... this is because we've gone outside the box and pulling from more Pathfinder-friendly resources like Iron Gods, you're actually a Series 1 android, not the current popular series androids that run around in Starfinder, where you have that sort of data line tattoo circuitry board look. Oh, I have that, but I need to do get tuckered for that to happen. Okay. There are abilities that I have which use my internal nanite reserve, which will then trigger the showing signs of circuitry. Okay. So, unbeknownst to android designation R3N, he walks upon sacred ground. These steps are actually a shrine to the river goddess Wajet, the very same priestesses that rescued our Dro Paladin who turned her religious sites onto Phrasma as opposed to Wajet. Now you think you're saved by a priestess of Wajet, you would, you know, join their order. But the priestesses of Wajet believe that river is life and they roam the river's edge looking for wanderers, travelers or whatever. They give aid, you know, they give the good word, but they're really not a Bible thumping uh, mythology type of priesthood. You know, they know, you know who saved you. And, you know, they help you on your way kind of thing. It's more of a Salvation Army thing than a, you know, now that uh, you've been saved by the church, <clears throat> here's the hat and, you know, listen to all of our sermons kind of thing. So as uh, time went by and our paladin discovered Phrasma, I guess we'll have to ask her personally in the future why that's the church for her. But going back to the scene at hand, the steps you walk upon are holy ground and priestesses as well as women doing certain things in its waters always the risk of crocodile attack freak out pretty much i mean you don't pop up and go <gasps> like you were swimming or whatever you just silently methodically purposefully emerge from the water eyes dead ahead scanning everything in front of you and just walk towards them so they all react and back off and stare at you they don't scream away in panic or whatever there's a lot of stuff weird stuff walking around Wati these days, but you certainly startle them. R3N. Yes. The um. culture, the structure, the settlement, as Mandel put it, is incredibly primitive. Sand, stone, mud, structured huts, open air windows, thin cloth awnings, cloth clothing, a babble, strange language, and multicolored, well, at least they're humanoids that actually look quite like yourself. Their ear shape, their haircuts are darker than your own, but, you know, they, this looks like a culture that you'll stand out, but at least they won't treat you like a monster. Two arms, two feet, weapons, you know, that kind of thing. That's a relief. But the tech level here is incredibly low, like dangerously low for your mission. This will make things more challenging. However, considering what your prey is, the nanites will probably have just as rough go because they would seek out electrical currents. They would seek out electricity, which means tech. They would find the closest source and try to meld with it, try to control it, try to take it over, try to, you know, spear it in the machine, as it were. This planet isn't wretched then. It helps to serve to contain then. 
Possibly. Now, this is just one settlement. I mean, you, you've seen planets with grand cities, then there's slums, and then there's like the outskirt desert waste kind of thing, okay? Um, it is very, very cool this morning. And as the sun comes up rather quickly, and everyone's hardly doing chores, trying to enjoy that happy, it's warm now before it becomes scorching hot. As you continue your footpath up to what looks like a massive, how the people all act in a sort of a reverent downtrodden program kind of style of mannerism this you understand mm -hmm. you're not sure what god they're worshiping but he's definitely a shiny god as this place is you know shall we say um stands out in superior architecture and superior dress weapons and clothing of those that uh, guard it you know as opposed to adjoining buildings i overhear anyone like have just emerged from the water yep um, people are startled and spooked. Yeah. Your brain is trying to um, process the language. You move forward. You're coming up on the vault. So you've been out of the water for like five, ten minutes. You're walking around. You're looking around. Right. Is there any literature? Any, just like any, if there's, so there's a temple, temples are uh, notorious for writing. Uh, there, Scripture. there is, but it's sparse. Most uh, literature is actually in the form of a sign. What has like a caricature or glyph or a single rune, not actual writing. Like if they have a tavern, you'd see the picture of a container that holds refreshment. Mm. If you symbology exactly, there's not a lot now. Um, finally, coming around the front of this structure, there actually is words inscribed in some foreign language. It's simple, simple, simple break, simple, simple break, simple, simple, simple break, simple, simple break, break. You know, ah, patterns, symbols, glyphs, yay, language. It's start. It's a primer. Okay. What do you want to do? I want to make a linguistics check on it. Bit of a penalty, considering it's like, you know, foreign. But then again, since you're a galactic traveler, I'll also give you the the idea that you're widely traveled, you know, have encountered thousands of languages. <laughs> Seven. <laughs> hmm. Need more data. Hmm. A, sing a single line on a single, and not enough to, like, make heads or tails of this. Okay. Well, but I, so that's a start. Um, so I mm -hmm. understand maybe the letter E. Yeah. Uh, uh, logically, hmm. this is going to be my way of asking you for an intelligence check. Okay. Six. No inspiration today. <laughs> the way, the way, the way that like even the, um, organization of the symbols seems sloppy, inefficient. Hmm. The gaps in the spaces of the actual symbols themselves is just a little bit of a puzzle too. It's not their fault. They're primitive. Hmm. But I want to carry heading on towards where I triangulated the signal of my quarry. Not triangulate, just a just a direction. Direction? I wish to keep you're, moving. You're headed, you're headed directly towards, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Yeah. The signal. And when you start veering off, it's like, oop, I got to pan left a bit. Or I got to correct myself. You know what I mean? Like a Geiger counter. Exactly. So you come out of the water, you find an easier place to land on the shore. Steps, great. You come up towards a structure. You're looking around. You're taking in the, the type of thing, right? You step up beyond the vault, the church that you're not quite sure what it is, directly into a marketplace. A throng of alien humanoids. Um, mostly the same distinguishing patterns and skin tones, height and um, gender and, you know, all that kind of thing. But there are some distinct flashes of, um, you know, unique races and stuff running through this. And it seems to be some sort of haggling, bartering, you know, trade. They are hoarding goods, trading goods, exchanging goods. Uh, market to market. Mm -hmm. oui. Anyway, uh, instead of entering this market, there is a, what barely passes in your recognition as a street heading left. Your Geiger counter is telling you to proceed in the direction you are. Would you know you start to veer off target? You want to kind of take your first street on your left and head towards you know your left, or shall we say east on this map? Yeah. So I'm just following that uh, while I, like at the same time taking mm -hmm. in any literature or trying to overhear conversations. Now, just double checking. I believe just so I don't get yelled at here. Um, the city, like the, the thing, the place itself is about 4,000 feet. So dividing that roughly by three, it's like 1,100 meters wide and about four times that as long, the entire settlement. It's not that big. 
considering you've you've seen like space planets that are like Corellia that are you know just freaking the whole planet you know how is far I've already traveled yeah I'm just just saying like this place is barely counts as a city to you but 1100 meters wide and about 7,000 meters long oh anyway yeah I meander even from where you are and you head towards the signal yes you come across a barrier but the roads you know as you wind through roads and streets and are passed and jostled by a whole bunch of people you eventually come to a wall and you follow it along and you come this barrier eventually leads to gates that are guarded at ground level as opposed to a wall that's guarded at top level are the gates open no they are not and there's like a dozen humanoids with um primitive melee edged weapons and projectiles lined up guarding oh. it. There's also a res- there's also a respectable distance of regular people that are tra- traversing the area. They don't interact with the guards. Mm. There's like an open space of like 30, 40 feet up to the gate. Is there a guard who looks more guardy than the rest? Looks more guardy? <laughs> more guardy? Has more stuff? Um, can I have an enchantment check, please? Sure. Now, I don't suppose you have no tr- lo- local knowledge. I don't think that would apply here. Interesting use of that, yeah, or Mandel scans or something, but... Um, Eight. Doing what we can. All right. Um, their uniforms are... Sorry, first of all, they're all wearing what barely can be considered armor, and but they have a uniform cut to their clothing, and there's nothing... There's no designation on the chest plate mm-hmm. like you have, where you actually have your designation number or any... Um, extra shoulder pads or better looking helmet or all those things in galactic space that usually make for a commanding officer they all sort of look I'm not saying you, don't, you can tell these are all officers or all rank and file but there's not one of them sort of stands out with like you know buffer armor or heavier weapons or not from your telling anyway okay um I go up to the closest one to me okay uh-huh. as you approach mm. two guards mm. intercept you they yeah, they don't, look, they don't look hostile. They just like so, come towards you. One hand. They meet me halfway. This is friendly. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Um, however, they are gesturing for you to hold position. One I, has his hand up in the usual, you know, in the universal uh, gesture of stop forward locomotion. Which is the middle finger, right? No, no. That's oh, uh, palm, palm That's universal. You. Yep. <laughs> universal stuff. Anyway, um, they Gre- seem curious. They. Uh, either they're issuing a statement or asking a very short question in a language you don't understand. I can I attempt to understand it? Sure. Uh, 14. The first one just speaks gobbledygook and they wait for an answer and you just stare at them and then he says something else and then the one beside him um, sort of motions at him, like taps him on the shoulder and switches language and with a 14 now let's talk about difficulty of language basic of syntax you know you're gonna have to pull off some pretty cool roles this is not a hard language it's almost what they would call universal common here and for you at the gate i'm looking for 15. so how about this a d20 can be broken into percentage 20 goes into 105 times so one on a d20 is five percent 20 on a d20 is 100 percent so doing some you know really silly basic nerdiness okay 14 is 70 percent so i will relay what i believe is 70 percent of the message so that you don't have to like meta and like i tell you the message and then you just try to understand 70 percent of it sure uh and i will keep this in the until you actually can speak to people better than like 75 80 and get most of it okay the guard indicates they want you to stop. They have a question. They want to know what your query is. What do you want of them? Yep. They seek your destination and intent. Greetings and salutations. How would I know any languages from this planet? Through your linguistics check, learning, and then taking ranks in them. Or, you know, because when you take a, ling- when you take a rank in linguistics, you get a free language, and then you could have learned, you know, ancient Osirian. Yeah. You follow me? Right. How about this? Because you're probably going to read and try to scan and learn regular Assyrian or something written down, ancient Assyrian, probably before you level, I'll let you have ancient Assyrian, but I'll still make you make linguistic checks to activate it. You know what I mean? This is a flavor thing, like, out of the gate, as opposed to making you take it later. Okay. 
because likely you you will learn the language quicker than a person can. You know what I mean? Does that make sense? Sure. Okay. So holding that rank until Mandel can upload the language for you or until you can get a, a serious section of text or a book or something to study and just Android learn it overnight, you know, that kind of thing. Hence, this is why, ladies and gentlemen, I let him put on his character sheet now. Um, going back to common, your inflection, your slang, your version of the language still be, and your vocal patterns still could be considered accent, foreign, you know what I mean? So I'm going to have these guys kind of figure out 10, 50%. So they get half of it. So they understand that you're being friendly, saying hello, and how's it going? And sorry, what was the main part of your question? I have a query. What is on the other side of this door? Linguistics check from you, sir. Every time I talk, I need a roll from you. I just won't keep asking. Just, you know, you want a sentence. Seven. It's going to... Seven. They think you're joking. Like they can't believe you'd ask that. That's all you get from what they say. I, I think I've messed up the language, so I try again, but slower. <laughs> okay, go again. Ted. All right. They slowly come back at you that this is a sacred place where they bury their dead. And entrance right now is not permitted. When is entrance permitted? They explain. 21. Natural. They tell you something about registering to get in. And anybody that registers can get in very soon within so many cycles of the sun. All you got to do is go to a certain place. They talk about a large place of worship in the center of town and you register. I think I know where this is. However, they cinch with your natural 20 and you really get it. They talk about a group. You register your group there and you gain entrance to the lottery and they will let you in in an orderly fashion. Thank you. You have been very helpful with your assistance. They are polite in dismissing you and bidding you farewell, but they do it very curtly. Hmm. Efficient. I like this. So you try and head off to the coordinates? I do. Okay. Oh, wait, no. That's the door. Through the one I'm not allowed. Nope. The beacon, the so beacon signal is through those big doors where you're not allowed. The, right. Where they want right. you to go to register is a 180. Like, quite literally. Yes, 180 I degrees in the other direction. Center town. Can't miss it. Giant structure. Well, they said large yep. temple of worship. I walked you past did. one already. I'm going back to that Okay. One. <laughs> All right. Uh, they point in a slightly different direction, but you do remember the worship, so off you go. So I head back. Vex. Yes. It's been a long time since you've been in Mwati. Bartolo. Arriving this morning on a barge at the docks in what's... Uh, beyond Bargetown, no, just outside what's known, like an industrial area called the Veins, you disembark. Bad memories. You haven't been to Wati since you crawled up and awoke in an alley and got the hell out of here and got yourself to Sothis or a different town. This is where you lost your hand when you were a boy. This is where something, a miracle, perhaps Razma sent her scarab beetles to find you. You have delirium passing out blood loss memories of lying in an alley thinking you're going to die being overcome by bug swarm or something itchy all over your skin uh, it's not like they were big bugs but there was enough of them that like a black swarm of something that you could feel and barely see got all over you and you passed out and you woke up hours later healed and invigorated and a new lease on life and felt like being a better person for some reason and got the hell out of Wati and now you're back. It's almost as if the city was ready to repay you with wealth for what they did to you. Because if you find a venturing party, register a name, you can enter the famed necropolis in the half-dead city and dig your way to fame, fortune, and glory. Oh, the sun has done on a new path to glory and wealth. Ain't life grand. Um, so I will um, make my way off the barge and uh, Sorry, do some after? gathering information to find the more seedy part of the city. Rogues Guild, Thieves District. Oh, here in Wati? The bla the darker side of the tracks. Uh, you found them actually in Sothis. Yes, but there must be a chapter in Wati. Uh, well, um, hmm. Uh, there is the underworld here. Can I have knowledge local? That's a raw roll. Fifteen. The underworld here is really big on drug running. There is a rather nasty drug that is comprised of the husk 
of like mummy wrappings in flesh and they turn it into powder and they make a really wonderful euphoric drug out of it and that drug trade pretty much dominates you know the underworld here they don't have like organized like thieves guild because of all the hand chopping they don't have organized like you know gambling and all that kind of stuff everyone just kind of does that on their own the only thing that's sort of gotten organized and is run uh, semi-organized by anything even closely to a gang more than a guild are a group of individuals that well they uh they snort mummy it's really nasty it's it's horrifying actually, actually it's it's horrible it's embarrassing because i have the name on the tip of my tongue uh the silver chain okay is the name of the gang and group and uh these buggers snort something far worse than pesh of your homeland well sorry they sell it and they set up shop here because and obviously they you know smuggle it out of necropolis which is full of interned dead now not every mummy is a mummy is a mummy okay the way osirian bury their dead at least in wati is they go through a mummification process where they remove the organs they wrap the body in, in specially alchemy tre- treated linens and they inter their dead in sarcophagi and stick them in a sacred room as opposed to like burying you in a box in a coffin six feet under and leaving you for sure. worm food okay anybody that's not undead you know doesn't have to wake up sure. and be horribly cursed um can that's sat there for x amount of you know years um can be used to be the you know ground zero substance of this drug okay well, i don't uh don't think i'm really into drugs so i don't know if i would search them out specifically but I probably would stop by the marketplace and see if I can replenish my coin stores by doing a bit of pit po- Sorry, pit replenish pocket. your what? My coin stores? Oh, you mean you're going to go steal from the very market that has that gruesome pole full of hands? You know, I bet your hand's still up there. Let's go find out. <laughs> hey, there's my hand. No, really, this was mine. You're just going to... Seriously, you go seek out... You go to the middle of Sunburst uh, Market? I, I will go seek out my hand. Yes, I will. Imagine the irony... What's he stealing? He's stealing the hands from the thieves that we cut off for stealing. Do we call the guard? I, I don't know. This is this is new ground for any of us here in Wadi. <laughs> like climbing up the pole. Do, 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 do. I, believe, I believe that this belongs to me. If you can prove it in court, they won't chop off your other hand. Otherwise, I, I would assume, because it's become property of the city and they display it to deter thieves, that you will be promptly arrested for disturbing. I didn't say I was going to steal it. I was just going to seek it out. Oh, okay. You know, have that mem- memory moment. Many, many hands have shriveled up and fallen loose and turned to dust out of the leather throngs that hold them there. And many, many, many more new hands have been added one by one over the years as thieves have been caught over the past 10 years since you've been here. I can't find my hand. I can't say that. I'm just going to say it's it's kind of a needle in a haystack, you know. It would be shriveled and blackened unless there's something really, really distinctive, you know, your own hand. Um, you know, completely emaciated and shriveled and rotten, picked at by crows. You know. All right. Well, I will. Uh, you know, I'll go and do some uh, reminiscing, <laughs> looking at <laughs> <it>. <laughs> not not necessarily the good kind. Uh, and uh, while I'm there, I will survey the marketplace to see if I can pick out anything of note. Okay. Times have changed. You know. Uh, the things of note are all the foreigners. Place is just packed with foreigners coming and going and going and coming. What about um, guard presence? Oh yeah, it, it's actually increased from what you remember ten years ago because of all the you know all the pickpockets and such that come out to to uh, try their luck with all the suckers and hopefully the extra throng of people to hide and cover up their you know your old uh, <clears throat> signature job. As it were. That's still my current job. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you just been moving around. Old habits die hard. All right. Okay. Yeah, ha- have a gander, and I'll take my time to do it. Find a nice place. Uh, if there's, like, a watering hole or a well where there, where there's people gathering, I'll walk up and wash the dust off my self. Uh, yeah. Self. Um, taking everything in, there is a... Um, it's on everybody's lips you know what i mean like people are talking at the proverbial water cooler you know it just can't be helped that 
you know, anybody that's anybody is talking about the Pharaoh's decree and, and partying up and, you know, wanting to get in on this action. The market hustles, the market bustles. And you spend the day reacquainting yourself to the city that betrayed you so many years ago. R3N. It's not long and several rolls, shall we say, that you find that you're at the wrong temple and they direct you to the right one on the other side of the marketplace. One of, the, one of the most interesting features um, about said marketplace is what's known as the Golden Pond or Golden Lake that's adjacent to it right in front of the Grand Mausoleum which is the temple to Phrasma. It is filled with stark white albino amphibious reptiles. Peculiar. But cute. Keep them as pets. Yeah. What a strange culture. All culture is strange. So, um, unfortunately, you are uh, rebuffed, shall we say, at the temple. They want to know your party, how many people are in it, its size, and, you know, you, you just keep getting the idea that, like, they will not let you traverse those gates solo. Where would one acquire a party? Uh, that's up to you. Amongst the local populace. That's what the priest says? Mm-hmm. That's what you... Like it takes you quite a while to with the back and forth and the rolls and let's say you take ten and take twenty on linguistics, you know he writes it out for you and you know this kind of thing. Hmm. If they have any books or literature, uh, yeah. Uh, what do you have for currency? Is the big question. Don't carry the currency that I would assume that you would accept. Oh. So what are you gonna do? No money, no bookie. Would I be able to read your holy text? That's even more expensive. I do not wish to take it. <laughs> They'll preach at you for free, but... Uh, <laughs> would you like to enter our acolyte program? Disrobe, put on this white gown, and step to the left. Hmm. I suppose, then... To find something of a gathering point, then. Okay, so what was your final decision? I guess I attempt to wander the city to find a party. Well, surely there must be a party I can latch to. Mm -hmm. By the end of the day, that evening, Vex, you come to the same conclusion. You need money to register. You need more than two people. You need at least three to enter the compound and have a legitimate party name or they won't let you in solo. Whether it's for, you know, for whatever reason. Uh, all these rules, always with the rules. I must find somebody who would be willing to delve into these dungeons with me. And I'll um, look to see if I can find the closest watering hole, as in cantina, par, bar, pub. Spending the day wandering the streets. Luckily, our droid doesn't fatigue. However, um, are you susceptible to heat damage? Like the blistering sun, the sun just gets hotter and hotter and hotter. We get to noon and a lot of people like bail, abandon the streets kind of thing. Gets Traffic gets really low. And then when we get past meal and siesta time, again, you know, commerce picks up again. This planet right. seems to have a 12-hour sun cycle, let's say, or 18-hour sun cycle where you have, you know, 24 hours for the, the planet to go around and... Well, heat stroke causes exhaustion and fatigue, so... And I'm immune to both of those. But you're not immune to, like, fire heat damage. No, no, no. Fire bad. Fire still always bad. Um, because fatigue and exhaustion are a condition, but out too long in the sun, in medium or heavy armor, you can actually take non-lethal damage from, like, actual heat it just starts, you know, melting your systems and you, you take non-lethal and you got to repair and it's a saying, so be wary of that. And you walking around in the sun all day, you be, sort of become conscious of like, hmm, this is really not good for my internal diagnostic systems. Anyway, funny enough, with the sun going down, a lot of people, like 90%, disappear off the streets. They all haul up in their little structures and dwellings. It's much easier to move around. 
and you would suspect a lot of crime and villainy and ne'er do wells start, you know, making their way out and about. Um, however, you do realize that after seeing very primitive light sources for warmth, because the night gets cold rapidly here, and, you know, for light, guards and people like carrying burning sticks over their heads to, just to see, let alone stay warm how easy it would be to get in there at night. But the local laws dictate you must have a party and register. That is true. Yes. Yes. Okay. If there's a lawful way to enter, I will lawfully enter. All right. The night passes, and whether we find ourselves at the Whispering Stone, the Tooth and Hookah, the Trading Post run by Half Fork on the south side of town, all attempts this late in the game from you individuals to find and form up a party are rebuffed. Any party, no matter, even if they're lacking a rogue vex or if they're lacking some sort of warrior, they're, they're good. They they feel they have enough. They don't want to split the take or they feel that you're so desperate that you can't be trusted. And everyone you inquire, no matter race, size, decree or whatever, you just keep getting turned down and have not much luck. Vex, seeking rest RN into the night to a point where again guards accost you and keep asking you what are you doing wandering the streets you should be you know just kind of finding a place to pass time I am looking for a party (laughs) yeah (laughs) middle of the night huh sun rises again and this time uh, if we've got him back Master Arif Yes. You arrive on your, shall we say, priest delegation barge, the priest party barge, specifically collecting priests up and down the river, phrasmic priests to like, you know, that type of thing. Get off the party barge and wham. There's no party like a phrasmic party. That's right. Everything off. happens as it's supposed to. <laughs> it's fate. You're so well paid and looked after. You are greeted at the dock by one priest and a small delegation from the voices of the spire they spread out and they have not also to protect you like again you guys are still possibly your priest but you maybe not be from here so that you don't quickly fall prey to merchant scams you know and a huge likelihood of problems they send you know three people to you know come and escort your little group of a dozen people to get off the barge this way to the temple okay okay Callistra, guard yes. guard duty is very boring guarding a bunch of old priests uh, they're really dipping like the first couple weeks you had soldiers and fellow voices of the spire and you know priests and youthful vigor and all this stuff now they're scraping the bottom of the barrel you see old men and acolyte children and you know coming from last minute details and you and two of your um, fellow acolytes, one a voice of the spire like yourself, who doesn't really like you because of your race, kind of prejudice, a Grundy man, and a young uh, priestess acolyte who's all flowers and sunshine and bright eyed, eagerly awaiting to, you know, telling people. The young priestess steps forward and welcomes her fellow priestesses with a classic gesture and blessing of phrasma and this way, this way, and you and your fellow sort of acting as a guard, just because we're short on numbers, you're your job is pretty much just to safely escort these people across town. That's it. Anyway, one guy is taking a sweet time getting off the boat. And the one guard just kind of motions to you like he's your problem and goes off with the young priestess taking the other 11 who are quickly moving up the dock. And the priestess is going on about how great the place is and you got to see the albino a crocodile. All this stuff's going on and it's just moving away from you. And here you are at the end of the dock waiting for this one doddering old man wearing homespun robes barely looks like if you didn't see the fact that he's coming off of this barge which is strictly priests you wouldn't even think he was one Master Arif would you describe yourself please uh, yeah, yeah yes of course I'll stand up and, 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 and dust off my homespun robes as they've been described but, but clearly they were in fashion a decade or so ago watch your tongue young man um, Arif stands up he's um, probably five eight, five nine. You know, age is kind of uh, 
taken a little bit away from him. Um, little on the light side, probably a buck fifty, one sixty ish. Um, physically, you know, he he looks like an older Kellishite man. You know, and arms and legs are thin. Um, he's got a, a big white beard. His hair's a little sparse on top. Eyes are a little, you know, sun faded, but you know, deep dark brown. Skin is super deep dark brown as well. Uh, g- gets up and, and and gathers up his satchels of extra books. You know, you, you can't leave home without those. Um, you know, he's not really looking up, paying attention, just that the boat has stopped moving. Uh, and as he's a little unstable on his feet, he reaches out for someone to take his hand as he steps down off of the boat. Okay. Kalistra, would you describe your character and what you're wearing today, what he sees as he looks up, motioning for your hand? She is wearing the regular desert clothing to try and escape the heat, you know, the headscarf, you know, only her face is bare and she has some scamma on top of that and a big old great sword strapped to her back. Um, you can see little strands of white wispy hair and pink eyes and dark skin, but that's about all that's showing. Now you said earlier you have this sort of dusky purplish hue yes. going on. Cool. So she would reach forward and take his hand. Welcome to Vati. Do you require assistance? Earth takes the, uh, I, I assume gloved or gauntleted hand, you know, if you're wearing armor. Uh, y- yes, thank you, young man. And kind of lets the words kind of trail off. <sighs> Looking at your skin. It's almost like he's trying to remember something and then his, his eyes light up a little bit. Oh, by the by the gods, I, I, I haven't seen anything of, of your particular make. He waves a hand kind of covering your, your shape there. Um, but I've read something about the dark-skinned creatures. Yes. Um, and Ijabril's tome of unlit places. Is This is not where you belong. I'm not sure if you're aware of that. And he steps off the boat and kind of surveys. I belong this, here far more than I ever belonged where I came from. This promises to be a, a rather unusual journey, I think. Phrasma must have things set forth for me. Now, <laughs> Phrasma nods. Phrasma's nodding like mad. You know, two of you alone on the dock. The paladin of Phrasma, meaning the cloister cleric of Phrasma. Fate ensues. Big silent nods from the god. Um, he gathers up the rest of his stuff and, you know, still has your your hand kind of in his. No. Well, uh, let, let, let's show me to where we'll be staying tonight. I, I have so many stories I'd love to hear from you. Absolutely, this way. 